Uh, hi everyone, uh, welcome to that seminar. So today's speaker is Adrian Taylor, who came all the way from the UK uh, for this talk. Uh, Adrian did his undergrad at the University of Bristol and then his grad studies at Imperial College. And he then worked for Symbian and Real DMC and a couple of other companies. And now he is at Bromium, and he will talk about the, about some work they do in the intersection of virtualization and security. And as you can see, there is equipment for a demo as well, so it should be good. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, so yeah, as thanks, yeah, as, as you said, uh, Bromium is a company that does virtualization and security. Uh, we founded by some of the same people who created the Zen hypervisor. So could I have a show of hands? Who's come across? Zen? Who's heard of Zen? Okay, excellent. So that's the hypervisor used in... How many can beat closer? Okay. <laughs> that's the hypervisor used in uh, lots of the major cloud services like Amazon and Rackspace and things like that. Uh, what I want to talk through today is what we do at Chromium. We try and isolate things in the endpoint uh, for added security. I'm going to give you uh, some slides, obviously, and also some demos <laughs> of some simple malware attacks and how we can help with that. And I'm going to need to see my notes, so just wander back and forth. Sorry about that. Um, Chromium as a company is 45 people, uh, or thereabouts, in Cupertino, so not far from here, and another 45 in Cambridge in England, so obviously you can tell I'm from the Cambridge side. And I want to start off by telling you a story. This is a true story um, about a petrochemical company. I've changed some of the details, but it's basically true. Um, every Wednesday, the CEO gets his emails stolen and he's getting quite wound up by this. Um, and the way it works is the attackers, whoever they are, the first tier of attackers will come along at 10 o'clock in the morning, say, and they will try some simple exploits that were tried the week before, well-known attacks, and they'll see if they can get the details, the, the commercial secrets, the trade secrets from this petrochemical company. So where they're exploring for oil, or where they're building rigs, or whatever commercial information they want. And usually that doesn't work, of course, because there's inevitably lots of, uh, lots of preventative measures on their network. There's firewalls, there's intrusion detection systems and antivirus and things like that. So usually that first wave of attacks doesn't work. So an hour later, if that didn't work, then the attackers will escalate within their organization. They're very organized, they're very commercially minded. And a second tier of attackers will come along and try something a little bit more uh, controversial, a little bit more fruity, and will try some exploits that perhaps haven't been seen very often and aren't well known in the security community. Usually that will work. And... Do you want the next? Hmm? next slide here? Oh, it's alright, I'll do it. Yeah, so often that will work, and often the attackers will manage to get the stuff they need. But if it doesn't work, a third tier comes along an hour later, and they'll try something completely new, some totally new exploit that hasn't been seen before. And in the end, the attackers will get their email um, and get the trade secrets that they need, which is all slightly sinister. Um, and I first heard this story about a year ago. This is still pretty much continuing. And the scary thing is, the company that's being attacked, they know they're being attacked. It's very consistent. They know when they're being attacked, and they know roughly who they're being attacked by but they can't do anything about it because there's always more zero-day exploits and things that the attackers can use. And in fact, they can characterize their attackers so well that they know when it's their appraisal time, when the attackers in this attacking company, or whichever organization it is, when, it's their, when their appraisal is due, their quarterly appraisal, they try that little bit harder, they steal some more people's email, and they do extra sinister stuff. So they can characterize their attackers that well, but they can't actually do anything about it. Um, and just in case you think this is a one-off incident, uh, clearly you guys here have the NSA um, and the Fox Asset revelations that uh, have come out of Snowden, in, Snowden in the past few weeks shows that the NSA does pretty much the same thing. They will choose attacks to use against high-value targets depending on the value of that target, depending on all kinds of criteria about how likely the attack is to succeed and how much they care about whether the attack is discovered and broadcast to the wider security community, so that it's subsequently an antivirus product and things like that. So this sort of phased approach with different tiers of attackers is used by you guys and other, other people around the world. Um, it's a great effect. So how does it typically work? It typically works with some sort of spear phishing attack. Um, that means that somebody gets an email or something which is very convincing, 
and causes them to load some data from outside the network, whether that's an attachment or visiting a web page, something like that. That will then result in the execution of code to parse and understand that data format. So a Debbie reader will open the PDF, or Internet Explorer will go and actually render the website. And they rely on exploiting some bug in that code to get some code running on the PC. And the bad guys only need to get a few bytes of code running, and from there they can build up to a more complicated payload, a more complicated and sophisticated attack mechanism, until eventually they can get enough code running on the machine to have full access to it, and fully poke around it and see what's happening there and on the, on the network. So once they've got that foothold, then from then on it's very easy for them to see what's going on both on the PC and on the wider network. And so two things about this story of doom sound a bit implausible. One of them is that there are so many exploits. Well, there are. So here's a price list, and I, I wish we'd come up with this, but it was uh, an article on Forbes.com showing how much on the open market you can buy a zero-day exploit for, for various things. So simple attacks for Adobe Reader, allegedly, go for just $5,000. So if the guy you're attacking, the company you're attacking, uses Adobe Reader, and you're a bad guy, it's economically rational for you to spend $5,000 just to go and attack him and steal any secret that's worth more than $5,000. For stuff that's a bit more secure, Internet Explorer, you're going to have to pay more. iOS, there's not a lot of vulnerabilities known, so you have to pay a lot to get a vulnerability, uh, to get an attack there. But these numbers I find quite terrifying. There is an open market on these things, and if you're a bad guy who wants to attack an organization, it's reasonably cheap to go and get a new zero-day exploit you can use to do that. Well, something like something like Chrome, which you know sort of does a better architecture because it uses yeah. more processes, running at lower privilege, and is also yeah. aggressively patched all every time yes. you start the browser. It's a good question. And actually, I simplified this table. In the original Forbes article, this row, Internet Explorer, also listed Chrome oh, for the same price. Now, I, as I say, this is not these are not our figures. Um, they sound plausible to me, but hmm. I would have expected Chrome attacks to be more expensive. Yes. Yeah, I would too. Um, so the other thing that sounds kind of implausible is that people would fall for these spear phishing emails. This is a photo of the limo at my hotel in Cupertino. Um, and the reason I bring this up is just last week, a guy called Kevin Mandia, who runs a very well-known, one of the premier internet security companies, he apparently got spear phished. And he got spear phished like this. He uses a lot of limos, and some bad guy somewhere sent him some emails which were, were purported to be the invoices for his limo journeys. So they not only knew which limo company he was using, but they knew where he was going so they could put together the right kinds of invoices. And presumably these were PDFs. And presumably he opened them. Presumably malware may have executed on his PC and in his network. So if the bad guys are going to go to that level of detail and possibly even have physical spies on the ground to find out what these guys are doing, then there's really no hope for us. And I certainly you know, I can't rule out that I would fall for a spear phishing thing, and I'm sure that that applies to basically anybody. So the combination of the very precise spear phishing and the seemingly unlimited number of zero-day attacks uh, is not a good story. And so what I'm going to do now is do the first demo. I'm just going to show you a very simple spear phishing attack. Uh, let me talk through the boxes I've got here. I don't know if you can see. Um, I've got my Mac, which uh, is just my Mac, but that's unrelated. I've got a Windows PC, which I'm attacking. The thing that's actually doing the attacking is actually down here a little Raspberry Pi. Obviously, I'm from Cambridge, so we have to use Raspberry Pis for everything. Um, but that's got Metasploit running on it. Can I have a show of hands? How many of you have heard of Metasploit? Yeah, and how many of you have actually used it? A few, yeah, good. So I'm sure you know more than I do. Um, so on this map, I'm going to move this terminal window over there. This is the Metasploit console pointing at the Raspberry Pi. And I've set it up with a simple web server on a little network here, which is deploying a Java-based exploit. And this exploits a bug in a slightly older version of Java. It was a zero day at the time. It's not a zero day anymore. It's fixed in modern versions of Java. But the point remains that a while ago, this would have been a real attack against the current version of Java. And right now, it's not. Um, and on the PC, if it comes to life, I will just show you what happens. So first of all, actually, I need to disable our own product. 
because otherwise it will defeat you. <coughs> At least in theory. So, I don't know if you can see that. Here is, here is a, a fake spear phishing email from Yanis. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and it's all about a survey of directory preferences. And obviously you guys all write curry, so I imagine that's the outcome of the survey. Um, but if we click this link, and I don't know how many of you actually would do, uh, but this goes to a, a fake URL pointing to a web server which is actually running an exploit. So the web server is being run by the Raspberry Pi here. That's acting as a web server serving up this exploit. So if I click on that link, we'll get Internet Explorer loading, and it should, all being well, navigate to the Raspberry Pi. Let's check that it actually does. Okay, so you can see a grey square there, that means it's a Java applet. And over on the Raspberry Pi, you can see it's downloaded some Java stuff and it's deployed an exploit which exploits a zero day bug, or what was a zero day bug, in Java to run some code on this Windows PC. So now, switching back to the Raspberry Pi, there's my cursor. All we had to do was run a little bit of code on this PC by exploiting that Java bug in that web page. And now we can poke around it fairly easily. Uh, what session number was it? Use it two. So we can do lots of things. Now we've got that little foothold in. We can find out about the PC. We can see the name of it. We can see it's a Windows PC. Um, we can find out what's running. There's a whole lot of apps running as you'd expect on a normal Windows PC. We can look around the file system. And in particular, what we really want is this document called Top Secret Stuff. <laughs> 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 so we're on the desktop, we can just download Top Secret Stuff. Whoops, that didn't work, but you get the idea. <laughs> um, it's kind of hard to type at this angle. Uh, top Secret Stuff. Okay, I bet I need quotes, let's see what happens. There we go. So, successfully retrieved the top secret stuff from this PC. Very, very simply. I'm sure you would agree that's slightly terrifyingly simple. Um, and of course, all you need to do is find some code on the PC which can execute <coughs> some bytes of evil malicious code, and that's the only foothold you need to deploy much greater, um, much greater payloads and much greater exploits and full remote administration tools. And of course, once I'm on this PC, I can also go and explore the intranet and the LAN, which is more related to what you guys mostly do in networking. So, so it's all a bit scary. Something's even more scary. As I say, I'm attacking from a Raspberry Pi here. If I were attacking from a full PC, I could and would deploy a much more, a more graphical um, remote administration tool to attack this PC. And I'd do it using Metasploit, so all the stuff you've seen would remain the same, but I would download and run an executable on the PC which provides me with more advanced hacking stuff. And some of the things that can do are a little scary. Obviously you can capture screenshots of what the PC is doing, you can install keyloggers, but the really terrifying thing, I can look through the webcam, of course, and see what this guy's doing, sitting at his PC, he doesn't know that's happening. And the really, really scary thing, you can turn off the little green LED next to the webcam. <laughs> <laughs> now that, I always thought that would be electrically connected, but apparently on most PCs it's not. Yeah. Close the spy back in spyware. So that's always really scary, in short. Um, and of course, the whole idea is that there's not a lot we can do about it. Because, potentially it's zero days that nobody can see before. So if I switch back to the slides. So our belief at Bromium is that detection doesn't work. There's an open market in exploits and zero days. And of course, the antivirus guys can't possibly keep up with that. There's always new attacks out there. And if you're a high value target, potentially you're going to be attacked with stuff that there's no hope of the antivirus guys seeing. And the same goes for the network intrusion, intrusion detection stuff. And by high value target, based on that price list of exploits, I mean anybody with a secret that's worth more than five grand. <laughs> so detection is a bit, a bit doomed. So we believe in isolation instead. We assume that in every web page there is malware, and in every PDF there is potentially malware. And we just isolate everything so that whatever it does, it can't break out and attack your PC and attack your network. 
what, that's, that's, you're saying that you're taking the same approach that the JVM and Chrome fail to do. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I'll speak at the end about the difference between sandboxes and what we do. I'll be happy to talk that through. Um, so we have something that we call a microvisor. Now, obviously, a microvisor is a very content hypervisor. It's a hypervisor which is optimized for lots of lightweight, small, similar micro VMs. And this uh, is based upon the, uh, the hardware virtualization extension we have in modern Intel and AMD CPUs. So for that reason, it can also be quite small. A lot of the hypervisors out there have lots of legacy code for dealing with complicated page table manipulation and things like that. But because we rely on VTX and on EPT, we can keep it quite small. And the goal here is to have a small attack surface. It's obviously based on Zen as well. Now Zen, as I mentioned, is a hypervisor that's used and trusted by people like Amazon and Rackspace for their cloud. Of course, in theory, on the Amazon cloud, there might be a physical machine that has two VMs, one belonging to Pepsi and one belonging to Coke. I don't know if there is, but it seems to be trusted to that extent that uh, people were willing to take that risk with it. Um, so the combination of using that well-established Zen technology and a particularly small version of it means that our attack surface is quite small. But the really clever bit we do is we integrate it into the desktop user experience, as it says there. So the goal here is that the PC basically behaves the same way. The user doesn't have to explicitly switch from a, a business world to a personal world or anything wacky like that that uses hate. It should just behave as a normal Windows PC, and we transparently isolate stuff, uh, which is really hard. So here is the second demo, where I do basically the same thing, but with Chromium enabled. Okay. So first of all, this is a PC. I've now enabled Chromium on this PC. And I just want to show you that it behaves like a normal PC. So you can see we've got a website here. You can do whatever you want. It just behaves like a normal PC. You can open lots of tabs. Do whatever you need to do. Um, Let's pick a random website. But you can see it's behaving like a normal browser. <coughs> and you can't really notice a difference. But it is actually very different behind the scenes. You can use a debugging thing we have called a status monitor to find out exactly what's running. And you can see we've got three micro VMs running there, one for each of those websites. So each of those websites has potentially got malware, but it's being isolated by our microvisor into micro VMs. Um, so whatever bad stuff does run, theoretically, it can't get out, it can't attack. And because our attack surface is small, it really shouldn't be able to. The same applies with downloads and documents and so on. <coughs> so here's a folder full of things. Um, you can see some of them have a little orange BR logo. That means it's regarded as untrusted. Those are files and documents we've downloaded from the internet or have otherwise come into the PC from some untrusted source. One of them doesn't, so this one is regarded as trusted. Maybe this is something we've created ourselves. And if you open a trusted one, it will just execute an Adobe Reader as normal on your PC. If you open an untrusted one, we will isolate it into a micro VM. And I want to show you the performance implications of that, because obviously firing stuff up in a VM sounds insane. So I'm going to double click on this trusted one. Pretty quick. Ours should be similarly quick. Yeah, so similar sort of performance there. Um, I used to work for real BNC, so that's why it's that one, but it's a long story. Um, so you can see that from the point of view of the user, it just functions like a normal PC. Some documents are trusted, some are not trusted, but they really don't have to worry about that. They just go about their normal business. And you can see here, on, again, on the status monitor, we've got an extra micro VM for Adobe Reader up here for running that PDF. <coughs> So let's see what implications that has on the attack that I showed you previously. So if I go back to um, to Yanis's naughty email, click the link. <laughs> we'll fire up a new browser tab. It'll ask me lots of annoying Java prompts. And then it will run it. But as you can see, it is running it in a micro VM. So if I now switch back to the, to the Raspberry Pi, It has opened another session, so you can see that a browser has connected and downloaded just the same stuff as it did before. We're not trying to 
trying to detect malware in any way. And if I hack into it in exactly the same way, session three, that would didn't work very well, did it? same way as I did before. <coughs> so, you can see, connected to a Windows PC, let's see what's running. <coughs> Similarly, we've got a list of processes. At this point, the attacker, if they're clever, will know something funny is going on. Lots of processes begin with BR, suspiciously. And there's, lots, there's rather fewer of the standard Windows processes running as well. Um, but nevertheless, it looks like a normal PC. <coughs> So the attacker might think, oh good, I want to steal their top secret stuff from their desktop. So they might check them on the desktop, do an LS, and they find it's not there. They find the top secret stuff is not there. And that's because we've isolated them into a micro VM. And that's really what we did. Yeah? Is that a question? So in case this is like a, a normal website and you want them to have access on the desktop, what happens there? So you wouldn't, in short. If, for example, supposing you go into Facebook or something and want to upload an image, mm -hmm. that's a good example, what we'll do is we'll detect that request or that desire from the website, mm -hmm. where we'll show you a file selection box on the host, you will select one individual file, and that one individual file will be moved into the micro VM and then uploaded to Facebook. Mm -hmm. So it does work. It just means we have to jump through some hoops. So that's it for the second demo. <coughs> so, a bit more about how this works behind the scenes. Here's a model of a PC, and in the middle, obviously, we've got the CPU and the hardware. <coughs> then, around that, we've got the kernel, and moving out, we've got the OS services and the OS libraries. And then there's apps around the outside, and here's three hypothetical enterprise apps that have to run on the host. They're the ones that keep your secrets customer relationship management and all these other enterprising type apps. Um, and those ones we don't try and isolate, we don't, we don't put them into micro VMs because they're trusted, they don't involve reading data from outside of the organization. But untrusted stuff we do isolate. We have this microvisor which is our very lightweight hypervisor. And anything that's untrusted, anything that involves processing data from outside the organization, we will isolate away. So maybe you go to Facebook, we'll create a micro VM for that, same for other websites. Similarly, if you download untrusted documents or PDFs, we'll create little slices of this PC, views of this PC <coughs> in, in this microvisor, yeah? So are you making an assumption that uh, the only attack vector is through the browser? No, so we don't, the attack vectors we support, Internet Explorer, Word, Excel, PowerPoint, Adobe Reader, Windows Media Player, zip files. So if I bring in a USB file, I mean USB stick with a, an infected file and then plug it into my computer? So by default, we mark stuff as untrusted, and there's, en there's ways enterprises can configure this policy, but if you bring in a USB stick that is assumed to be untrusted, and if you want to open a file from a USB stick, if it's, if it's one of those file formats we support, it will just be opened in a micro VM, so it's safe. If it's some other file format, you're going to have to explicitly mark it as trusted uh, according to enterprise policies and so on. So the attack surfaces that we cover are the vast majority of the ways enterprises are currently attacked. It's not absolutely everything, but it is the vast, vast majority of the way that data comes into the enterprise, um, and so that, that's the most the majority of the attack surface covered. So <coughs> things like bringing your iPhone to work or some, you know, where it's compromised and <coughs> attacks your network or something you, you don't have, have a solution for immediately. We don't have a mobile version yet. Um, and yes, this, what we're doing can't possibly cover every conceivable attack vector, but actually it does cover almost everything and it's hard to see how you can protect against that. If people are gonna bring their own device and attach it to the network, and until we have a mobile version, that particular use case isn't going to be covered. <coughs> yeah. So how, how does this case, how many micro VMs you can run? 
Uh, you can run 50 or so on a normal enterprise laptop. We're quite intelligent about swapping them in and out as well, so if you have background web tabs you're not using, then we'll swap them out. So actually, it really has no implication on the normal function of your PC. Yeah? How much memory each uh, memory uh, I'll come to talk more about it in a moment. And I'll get onto the performance side of it in a little while, how we can make it work very well. But before we do, um, how does this actually offer security benefits? And the answer is that each of these micro VMs has limited access to your secrets. So, secrets might be on your internet or they might be files on your PC. Oops, that's the wrong button. So this PDF, for example, doesn't need access to any of your files. It doesn't need access to your internet at all. So we don't let it have any network access whatsoever, either to the internet or intranet. And we don't have it, let it have access to any of your files. So that micro VM doesn't have access to any sensitive stuff at all. For Facebook or something, clearly it is going to need internet access. But it's not going to need intranet access. So whatever stuff's happening in that Facebook VM isn't going to be allowed to access your corporate intranet. And of course, it's not going to need access to your files, with the exception of stuff like uploading images, which I've already talked to. So the implication here so our product is typically configured by the enterprise admin when they install it, but in the absence of that configuration, we'll pick it up from uh, the standard Windows settings that explain which zone is which in terms of the Internet Explorer settings. There is configuration to be done there if you want to open it. Yeah? So, so this, these settings are per document, like all PDFs are contained the same way, or can you make it more specific? In terms of the intranet versus <coughs> internet settings, uh, in, in terms of what permissions they have, so you said PDFs shouldn't access the internet. Yeah. I've seen a creative use of PDFs for forms and so on. Yeah. It's quite magical. Yeah. In a bad way. Uh, <laughs> but, so, so can you, you know, let's say an enterprise uses yeah. forms or some other PDF stuff. So, in general, no. If you have something like that, if you have a PDF which needs to access the internet, you can mark it as trusted. Obviously, then all our security protections disappear. As time goes by, and we're a young company and we're always working on more use cases like that. But if you have a PDF right now that needs to access the internet, then it will need to be a trusted PDF. So if I click on a URL inside a PDF, you're not going to create a new, inside a new <coughs> micro VM. We will detect that click. We will let the host know that it needs to produce a new web browser to go to that PDF. Uh -huh. That's to that website, and that in turn will create a new micro VM to run the browser business. Are you going to talk about your micro VM architecture? A little, yes. As much as I can get away with. Uh, right. So the main thing about our micro VM architecture is that they, the micro VMs are very much copy on write. So that's why the memory overhead is not too bad, because on the whole they share the vast majority of the data, and that applies to both disk structures and to the in-memory structures. So when you create lots of blank browser tabs, <coughs> they will share all the memory, pretty much. Um, and only when you actually come to do something with those tabs will the memory footprint start to diverge, at which point we will do the pages in a copy and write fashion and only store the differences. So the memory footprint of each additional micro VM is actually basically zero until you do stuff with it, at which point it becomes very similar to the extra memory you would have used had you been doing it in a normal host browser or something like that. So it's all very much based around copy on write, and that is, that's why we can be quite lightweight and run an awful lot of micro VMs on one computer. Yeah? So what about the browser cache and the cookies? Exactly, very good question. So the cache, we don't, I have to be careful about this, I'm not 100% sure. I can't answer your question about the cache. Um, cookies, we will, we will be very careful about which cookies we make available to each micro VM. So if you produce a micro VM to go to Facebook, for example, we will insert the cookies that are relevant to that website and only those cookies. So whatever malware runs in that micro VM can't go and um, steal other logins and other data. It's not as simple as that. There are complicated rules, and I can't remember what they are. I know that they have taken a lot of time to get right. It is a very complicated area, and the same applies to things like DOM storage and so on. There's actually quite a lot of ways in which browsers can store state 
and we do support them all, it's all very complicated. So we assume there will be malware in some of these. And obviously, that's bad, but it doesn't really matter because they're isolated into micro VMs. And when you navigate away from that website or close down that VM, that micro VM just ceases to exist and will disappear. So whatever malware attacks you get, so long as they are in one of these micro VMs that we've isolated the untrusted stuff into, it just ceases to be a problem. And that's about it, but there is one more thing I'm going to cover in a while, in terms of what you can do to look at the malware that's attacking you. Um, but are there any questions about the general sort of isolation role of our stuff first? Yeah. yeah. So one of the biggest problems with browsers is that often a single uh, browser security is that often a single page will contain content from lots of different sources. So yes. A good example is Facebook. And yeah. so Facebook, you know, you load apps. And whenever you load an app, it basically gets access to the, I mean, anything on the page really has access to the DOM. So it can read everything on the page. So anything, any ad that's compromised on Facebook, any app, any any malicious app, whatever, it can read all your data from that page. From that page and yes. a lot of a big source of like attacks is sort of compromised advertising servers. You know things of the you know, the double clicks of this world where they're tricked in this into like serving a malicious ad, which is part of your legitimate content. And since it's in the same <coughs> DOM structure, basically as it has access to everything on your page. So it seems to me that isolating single web pages isn't enough. You actually need to isolate the sub elements as well. There is a strong argument for that. And it gets particularly complicated with things like iframes and so on. Um, exactly. We don't have a solution to that. In whatever untrusted content happens on your Facebook website will be able to access all the other untrusted stuff that happens on your Facebook website. Could you say about the incremental cost of opening another page? Like, do you have any kind of... Comment on, on it. Well, they're really... If you think about it, supposing that you've got IE running, you then open another website, maybe it's going to take, I don't know, 100 megabytes, 200 megabytes to render that extra web page. That's basically exactly the same footprint as us, because everything else is shared in a copy and write fashion between the micro VMs. So the additional RAM usage is very similar to the additional RAM usage of IE. Well, again, I don't use IE for yeah. like, obvious reasons. Yeah. But, um, you know, I use Chrome, and what I know for sure is that even if you open just a few tabs, you may put the run on the only laptop. So yep. and presumably, they do the yeah, update. They do all the same stuff, right? They don't do, they do put and write, and yet it doesn't. Yes. It was just 100 megabyte, you know, I could have opened more than three tabs. Yeah. I mean, a modern browser rendering engine uses potentially a gigabyte of RAM for a complicated web page. As I understand it, Huffington Post is particularly brutal. If you go to Huffington Post, it's going to use an awful lot of RAM, an awful lot of CPU. Um, and there's nothing we can do about that. It's just we try and not use any additional overhead beyond that. Yeah? Is there an argument that there's two separate problems that we're conflating here? It's the, <coughs> the browser is one case here, and you know, one case reasonably say, you know, a lot of people obviously see browsers, so you don't need to dynamically execute a VM, you know, so you use a conventional VM for that, and then with PDF documents, you think that the better approach would be to have some virus detector on the, on the, on the PDF, so you can take it from untrusted to trusted, because that's something where, imagine somebody receives this untrusted thing, and they just attach it as an email and forward it to somebody else, go through this <coughs> yeah. transition there, and as Richard mentioned already, you know, there's, there's a need for it to be treated as trust material. So what are there two problems here? The documents and the web access? Well, our view as a company is that there's plenty of zero-day exploits out there, and so trying to detect them just can't work. And so transitioning from untrusted to trusted is a difficult operation, and you have to do it based on your, your belief about the provenance of the document rather than any detection of any actual malware. So it's an operation that a human has to do. I'm not sure that really answers your question about the two, the two different use cases. Well, no, I, I think, um, I just think that the engineering solutions uh, might come I think, uh, if you look at this two different problem. Ultimately, we use the same isolation mechanism for documents and websites because that's the isolation mechanism we have. Right. And <laughs> well, if all you have is a hammer. <laughs> well, to, to, come back to, to 
to come back to the previous point about about the Chrome sandbox, I think that you meant. Yeah, yeah. The question, my question is like, why are you guys? What? Why? Why, why would we do all why, this? Why, why, why do you think you're you're smarter than Google? I guess is the basic question. Sandboxes. I mean, because they're doing the same thing, right? Except they're trying to use, you know, like on macOS, they use the the, the OSL virtualization, type, you know, and 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 which you know maybe has errors in it, but Zen has bugs in it too. So mm -hmm. I mean. I mean, I, I'm sort of not clear like what the difference is. They do the same thing. It's a virtual machine. It's it's copy on write. I mean, it's yeah. it's uh, it's basically the same approach as far as I can tell. It, it is a very similar approach. But the difference is in sheer attack surface, and that theirs runs on top of the OS, and so potentially they're vulnerable to a whole class of kernel bugs and things which we're not vulnerable to. And we have some quite dem quite good demos where we stack a bunch of sandboxes on top of each other, and then use a single kernel exploit to just break out and defeat them all. Um, because our stuff is below the level of the kernel. All you're trusting is that that small Zen-based hypervisor, and the attack surface is just a couple of order of magnitudes smaller. That's all. It's just sheer sheer attack surface size. Is yeah, that so, your so question? Yeah, your argument is that the is that the Zen could, is that your argument is that that um, that sandboxes are vulnerable to to kernel bugs, which have a larger attack surface than the hypervisor. On the other hand, you know I'm, I'm you know familiar with lots of exploits in VMware and Hyper-V and I expect that Zen is not immune to them as well, and if this process, if this catches on, you know, it's likely that you know people will yeah. start. It'll be a mobile line for Zen exploits, right? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. We don't claim that there's no, no no ways you can defeat this. We just claim that the attack surface is much smaller, so they're just much harder. And it yeah. comes back to that money-based slide in that you know yeah. you want the attack surface to be sufficiently small. It's hard yeah, to there, find. there is one one ray of light, and that is that that is that there is one kernel, the L4 micro kernel, where they actually proved that it meets the specifications. Yeah. Now, whether we understand the specifications or whether there are logic errors in them, <laughs> that, that remains to be seen. Yes. But it, but you know, potentially with what it was a twenty or two hundred man years they spent working on it, they were actually yeah. able to prove it correct. So are you gonna try to do this with Zen? It's a good question. Or you or switch it to L4 where they've actually done the work. Also a good question. And it was one of the first questions I, I asked when I joined and I can't remember what the answer was. Uh, it would be lovely to to formally verify the hypervisor at the root of all this, because it is your root of trust. It is extremely you need important. it. I mean, and that's that's. I think a lot of the work in like uh, you know, like information controls is precisely trying to do that, trying to prove it correct. Because if you can't prove it correct, you really don't. There, you have no really compelling reason to believe it's correct. Mm -hmm. Sheer size of attack surfaces, <coughs> apparently. And yes, we're not claiming that's a. We're not claiming that there's no bugs in it. It's just they're much much fewer. Did you have a question behind? I guess one, because you mentioned the, the, the economic price of exploits. So, so what's the going price for, for microvisor exploits? That's a, a really good question. Um, we haven't seen any yet, but it might be out there. Yeah, <laughs> but it's you, expected that, that if it is, the tax surface is smaller, that the price for it is would be huge, much yes. Much higher. Right? That we would certainly expect if there's like two orders of magnitude less code or three orders of magnitude less code, you'd expect the attack. The price of the attack to be two or three orders of magnitude higher, and thus it won't be economically sensible to attack people who are using this sort of approach. Yeah? So, so, how is it different from running the browser all the time in a separate uh, hypervisor? So, in, yeah, so the, the main differences are we're very optimized on lots of small, similar VMs, so it's a much more lightweight approach. And they are disposable, essentially. They're ephemeral and they only exist for the, the length of time that you're using a particular website. So whatever malware and attack there is gets thrown away. I think the other answer is that it's nicely integrated in the user interface. It's yeah. seamless and pretty that's right. You know, I mean it's pretty transparent to the user. Yes, that's right. So I mean some of the other virtualization solutions that have been proposed for the endpoint for they expect the user to switch between a business world and a personal world and explicitly make that choice. And of course the users tend to hate that. And it doesn't necessarily offer that many security benefits because to compromise the business world, you just have to send a CV or something to the business world which has some exploit in it. At that point, your business VM is compromised. Whereas because these are small, they're just used for a single task and then they're thrown away. There's no way that an exploit can persist. So do these micro VMs have network access, either local or remote? Yes, so it depends on what you're using it for. If you're using it for a website on the internet, it will have internet access but not intranet access. That's your question. And what regarding the hardware, they have access to everything. Like the example that you gave with the camera. Yeah. How would it be different now? 
it's all configurable on, on the basis of what hardware you're talking about, but in general, by default, they won't have access. Yeah, I'm, I'm interested in, in your sort of underlying architecture. You know, for example, are are you actually you know running you know running? I mean, presumably if it's Zen, you, you really have multiple instances of the of the Windows kernel of the NT kernel with their own with their own you know kernel data space. Is is this correct, or is it, or are you mainly or are you sort of slicing it at the application level? I sort of wonder a little bit about your architecture. It is at the lower level. Yes, I can't talk in too much detail about that, unfortunately. But yes, it's a from the point of view of inside this VM. It looks like a blank copy of Windows. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so the interesting thing, I guess, is, is um, you know, how do you handle things like? Uh, I mean, you have a very interesting example where, um, where you have different views of the file system, and but from Zen's perspective, like it doesn't know that much. Zen doesn't really usually know about file systems. It yeah. knows about disks and disk blocks. Yeah. So, um, so what mechanism do you use to, to make it appear to make it so that you can sort of see this directory, but you can't see all the pieces, all the files in it? That's very interesting to me. It is interesting. Um, it's a a process that I can't really talk about, but you can imagine. <laughs> I'm trying to work out how much I can say. Um, from the point of view of the inside of the at the end, it just looks like a disk. It just looks like a blank disk containing Windows, containing the app she wants. But as in, in the real world, we don't actually copy anything. So you can probably reverse engineer some of it from there. Yeah, yeah I can probably figure out one way of doing it. Uh, another approach that's like used in Linux is the, is the OS level virtualization approach. Yeah. And uh, well, you know, like, like Linux containers, for example. Yeah. And and this, this, you know, it's been people have done this in Unix for years, you yep. know, dating back to Sharoot and BSD jails and, yep. and things like that. And I guess the, the discipline, it seems that you know, you could do something similarly with this. Similarly, you do the same thing using OS level virtualization Absolutely. on. Yeah. On Linux, the disadvantage, I guess, is that you still have that larger kernel attack surface, and exactly. everybody's running on the same kernel. Yeah, and you could argue that the OS level virtualization you're talking about there is conceptually the same as the sort of sandboxing that Chrome does, and it's all on top of the OS, and it's all using kernel facilities to do that isolation, and that's fine as long as they hold out against the attacks. Yeah, yeah. So I have a question for you. Why doesn't Microsoft do what you're doing? Seems like a good idea. Good. Glad you think so. Have to ask Microsoft. <laughs> Because it seems that, I mean, the sad part thing is that all of this is, you know, it seems to me that virtualization is this huge hammer and using it to solve problems because the OS is essentially broken. It doesn't do permissions right, it doesn't do protection right, it doesn't have, it doesn't have process isolation, like all these things that it's the job of the OS to do, it just doesn't do. We haven't figured it out for like half a century. And yeah. We think it's hopeless. It's, it's just kind of sad. Yeah. <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> okay, I'll move on to the last bit. Um, which is, oh. Okay, can we can last question. The question is, do you have a Mac version or a Linux version of it? I will come to that. Okay. <laughs> Guys, can we keep the questions, yeah. like yeah, give, give questions him five minutes to wrap up and content. then... So I've talked all about isolation so far, which is the main value of our product. It's isolating potential sources of malware into these micro VMs so that it can't break out and attack your PC or your network. There is one more thing, which is what we call live attack visualization and analysis. In these micro VMs, we know exactly what's supposed to be running. We know we created this, this micro VM for precisely one task, to run exactly one web, website. Now, in the old days, before all this stuff, if an enterprise got attacked by some malware, probably the enterprise IT guy would not find out about it. The best case scenario is that they did find out about the malware, they did find out about the attack, and then they'd have to run around frantically on plugging PCs. Now, we don't, that's not necessary for us, assuming that you trust our isolation, because we're keeping the malware and the bad stuff locked up in a micro VM. And also, we can introspect it and see exactly what it's doing a little bit. And we can do this because there's exactly one task running in each micro VM. We know we created it maybe for showing PDF or for going to a particular website, and we, can, we know the expected behavior. If you open up IE, to go to a particular website, we know that it shouldn't be putting auto runs into your registry. We know it shouldn't be trying to overwrite your boot sector. There's a whole bunch of things we know it shouldn't be doing because there's precisely one task in this micro VM. You can't make those assertions about your host Windows system because it's going to do dozens of different things, but because it's one task per micro VM, we know what we should be expecting. And so if it does something different, we can tell the network IT guys that something fishy is going on. And because it's isolated, we can let it play out and uh, watch what happens and watch what the malware does, which is pretty cool. And it's not the main function of our software, but it is quite cool. It's quite, uh, quite a bit more visually attractive than the, the boring isolation stuff, which is actually the main value of our software. So on top of all this introspection we do, we have APIs, so you can inspect the attacks that have happened. 
and find out what the malware is doing, find out what it's contacting, all sorts of things like that. So a quick demo of that stuff as well. This feature is called Lava for live attack analysis and visualization. And we'll notify this across the network as well. But here is the, the basic UI for inspecting an attack that happened on this PC in a micro VM. And this is, in fact, what I did. Um, this is the same attack I did, I just did it uh, a few days ago. But So if I turn on all these different things, we can see what happened. So some Internet Explorer malware, contacted a website. Invoke Java, you can see at the bottom of the screen exactly what executables were executed. You can follow through and find out exactly what it is until eventually it got a command shell and started poking around the PC. And we, can, we know all this because we were able to say one task per micro VM, we know when it's doing something funny and we can start instrumenting it and watching what it does. Here's a slightly more complex one from a while ago. In fact, a lot more complex. A rather more typical attack. So it dropped and executed a file here. This is the bit I was looking for. So it contacted all these IP addresses and did lots of complicated stuff. At some point, it dropped and executed a file. And the good thing about this is you can find out the SHA ones and the MD5. So it's kind of complementary to antivirus systems. You can take that knowledge and insert that into your antivirus systems as well. And it fiddled with the registry, so maybe it looks like it did something with the Internet Explorer proxy settings, I don't know if you can see that. Lots of registry values changed, lots of tracing masks and stuff. Uh, did some more internet connections, lots of auto runs. And eventually ends up executing command shells and doing things like that. Weirdly, it, it ran ping at some point, I don't know why. But, so you can see exactly what's happening in these micro VMs in the case of the, where there is an attack, which is quite cool. It, as I say, it's not really the key feature of our stuff. The key feature is the isolation, but still, this looks much more cool. So yeah, in terms of what we support, what's going on? right now we support Windows 7. Um, we're working on Mac and Windows 8, and also some VDI stuff. And in the future, there will be mobile versions. I am one of the mobile guys, so that's the bit that I care about. But right now, it's obviously an enterprise product, we're aiming at enterprises, and they, they, the vast majority of them use Windows 7. And that is just about it. So, I'm sure you'll have more questions for me. Yeah. I was wondering if uh, you have like a stratified uh, product or a stratified market. I was thinking about like a spec for classified customers. I can't talk about what we do with classified customers, funnily enough. Um, no, I can't talk about that. <laughs> Any more questions? Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, I don't know, I mean, I'm an iOS developer, and it seems that this is something that, you know, Apple, you know, there's, they don't provide the interfaces to do it. There's no way you can possibly run a run like this yeah. on your iPhone. So what are you going to do on that? It's a really good question. We may not do anything on the iPhone, we'll have to go and see. Uh, from my point of view as a mobile guy, iOS does not have a real malware problem right now. Not a significant one. So, I have to wait and see how that develops. And. I think for Apple, I mean, speaking frankly, I think for Apple to be interested in this, there would need to be a significant iOS malware problem developed first. Yeah. So, um, do you do something special about address-based minimization? You know, I'm assuming that the Windows does that in each of these micro VMs, right? Doesn't it keep your copy on right? We do the copy on right. Um, after most of that is set up, so it doesn't cause us problems. Um, the characteristics of the micro VMs may be more similar in that respect than we would ideally want, but because we've got the isolation from the, um, from the hypervisor anyway, it's, it's an old problem of security measure. So essentially, there's no randomization to be in the Yeah. Any more questions? So, um, I guess, what do you think of, uh, I mean, do things like, uh, you know, Windows, you know, user access control and outgoing firewalls, do, do those things help at all? 
because uh, you know certainly it seems like an outgoing firewall to detect all these weird connections. And perhaps you know UAC is designed to protect the registry, for example. Yeah. So the, uh, yes. I'm a mobile guy as well. So one of the first things I did was when uh, when we started seeing these traces, I decided to write a quick app which would uh, plot on the on a map on a Google Maps control on my Android phone exactly what IP addresses were being contacted by some typical malware attacks. They were absolutely everywhere around the, uh, the globe. It was a bit depressing because I wanted to see some cool patterns and see where the attacks were coming from. But obviously, that was naive, and they just bounced off so many proxies and servers that there was no pattern to be discerned. And if I can't discern a pattern, I don't think a firewall can use do so either. Does that convince you? <laughs> in terms of the registry access, yes. Um, again, if you are trusting the kernel, then that can minimize what can be done um, in terms of installing auto starts and stuff. And you should, you know, Internet Explorer shouldn't have, a renderer process should not have the rights to do that. And it can only do that if it's found some way to escalate privilege. Yeah, one of the most, I guess, famous or infamous, uh, I guess, exploits is Stuxnet, which ultimately deployed sort of malicious Windows update server. And uh, do, you, do you have any thoughts on how to protect against something like that? No, not <laughs> Yeah. So, so when talking to your customers, I mean, do you see that uh, some simple exploits like PDF or just asking users to click on like random links are are they like the cause for most of the attacks and worries for large scale yeah. enterprises? Yes. And what about things like uh, uh, the sub, let's say the hardware supplier to uh, the enterprise itself is like compromised and they insert some root kit yep. or something like that within the hardware. It's all very sad and disappointing, yes, and it could happen. It could yeah. happen, but does that happen? Like so at the moment, moment, we don't guard against that. In the future, you know, as one of these slides said, we are working with the trusted execution technology and things like that to assert uh, exactly what our hypervisor is and check that it's not been tampered with. So you may see us doing more in that area in the future. Do you see such cases? Uh, I haven't. Um, I have heard of them, but probably in the same way that you have in general media. Yeah. So if, if Microsoft picks this up, let's say, yeah. I think there's a lot of question of why they use this. Um, it seems like you know the Windows kernel does all the stuff they do related to this. So do you have an idea where how they could simplify the Windows kernel, assuming it's running on top of all this? What, what Windows API is, is a terrifyingly powerful and the interactions that we permit between the different micro VMs are not the same set of interactions that are permitted between different Windows processes. Um, and in, indeed, we use a lot of powerful Windows APIs to make this transparently possible. If you think about Internet Explorer, we have to use a lot of powerful things there to be able to chop up Internet Explorer into multiple different websites, essentially, or multiple different browsers, essentially, split across different VMs. And if Windows has that sort of incredibly powerful API, it's hard to imagine how Windows can be secure unless they radically simplify the API space and attack surface on Windows. Yeah, it's, a, it's a really interesting approach that basically you you know you sort of fork Internet Explorer into another VM. You know, that's, that's really quite that's really that's a pretty clever idea. Sort of, I don't know, sort of like, okay. It seems like a good pro, a good idea that should just sort of you know be, be generally explored explored some more there. I guess there are some extant examples of, of other of uh, of things other pieces of software doing that as well. And, and also, there, there are things like you know, Google Native Client and stuff. But I think uh, but the idea of, of forking into another VM is kind of perhaps maybe the most interesting uh, aspect of, I mean, I mean that the sort of key aspect of your approach I think is pretty interesting. It is hard, as you can imagine. And lots of this technology is really, really difficult. The hypervisor level stuff is really hard. The transparent, making the UI work stuff is really, really hard as well. Yeah, but the conceptual idea of like, well, you know, when I run a piece of code, um, you know, when I jump into a function, you know, actually switch to another VM mm -hmm. is really interesting, yeah. and, and you know, that's something that, that I haven't seen. I've seen a couple times, but uh, it seems like a really sort of interesting mechanism that you can use for a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. I've seen it used for optimization as well, which is interesting. Your product only works for browsers. Uh, so the use cases we support at the moment are browsers, uh, PDF, um, Word, Excel, PowerPoint, Windows Media Player, zip files. I think there might be a couple, there are definitely a couple of other things, but those are the main things that we, we isolate right now. You may see that expand in the future. Okay, time for one more question. <coughs> so, uh, how much extra work is involved in adding more applications to the suite of applications that you support? 
the way we've architected it is very generic, um, but there's a lot, lot to be thought about in terms of making them work properly because you have to consider their interactions with the rest of the system. And if it's a very simple application, it's reasonably trivial for us to put it in um, it's a, an isolated small computer. But if it is a, a more complex app that interacts with the rest of the system in sophisticated ways, then we have to intercept more things and make sure that those are handled properly across the band. Thank you very much.